What's up, everyone? Welcome to another episode of the Mehran Podcast. Today, my guest is Phil Casabon. Right after recording episode one, which was about Phil's 2020 season, we did another podcast separately to talk about his entire career. We talked about everything from his youth up until now. So B-Dog on Wild, Level 1, B&E, Tempo, The Education of Style, Let It Flow, and much, much more. Again, it was a really nice conversation and I really learned a lot from behind the scenes of all these projects. Let's go. Mr. B-Dog. We're back. What's up, Xavier? What's up yourself? Chilling here uh, in the mighty goodness of the fall in VDP. We did a podcast to talk about your latest year and everything that happened. Your movie project, your two movie projects. And I wanted to do a separate one because you've already talked about your career on other platforms, but I wanted to still have that conversation with you because I think there's a lot of stuff to be talked about and a lot of stuff to go in deep. So let's start. Let's do this. So you grew up in Shawinigan, Quebec. Tell me about the upbringing of someone who grew up next to a resort. Yeah, f- uh, very fortunate. I grew up next to Valide's Park, which was owned at the time by my grandfather, and his two brothers. So basically they created a sort of little um, atmosphere with all the houses being inspired by Switzerland style chalet. And if you were agreeing on building yourself here, you had to have a Swiss chalet style. That was the thing at first, like uh, 49 years ago when it got built. And uh, my parents were one of those people that built their house there and I lived right next to the ski resort and we had a a little hill that was basically uh, scattered wood that you could go through and basically land at the at the hill so I was fortunate to not have to pay for my lift tickets and had a season pass when I was born basically. I didn't know first that you your family owned it or Anything related to that? Did your grandparents found the mountain? Like founded yep. it? Mm-hmm. That's crazy. So did they, how did that happen? Do you know the story behind it? How did they manage to buy that hill particularly and the whole project of starting a ski resort? That's kind of special. Yeah, it's wild. I don't know. Uh, I have to, that's something that you caught me off guard. I have to look into the history a bit more. Why, what was, obviously the purpose was, they loved skiing and they wanted a ski resort and they also wanted to capitalize on this beautiful place that once was called La Vallée de Cendrillon in those years. and uh, The Cinderella Valley. The Cinderella Valley. And uh, soon enough, it got switched off to VDP, Vallée du Parc. And uh, I don't know why my grandfather and his brother's first were motivated to do so probably a uh, love for skiing and outdoors activities because mm, it's right next to Shawinigan which is kind of a medium-sized city well small city but enough people to make a, a living with a resort right and it's kind of the only one in the area right at that time it wasn't at that time there was a uh, Saint Mathieu's Park which is uh 10 minute drive from here mm. and there was also Val Maurice which is in the south of Shawi, and even more south, there was Mont Carmel. So there was four resorts. So there, there was like a pretty big community of skiers and ski racing organization that would tour these four stations, plus La Tuc, which is more north. What was the schedule for you? Were you like uh, skiing on the weekend, skiing uh, every day after school? What was it like for you? Yeah, exactly, exactly that. Uh, my parents got me on the ski racing team. So I was ski racing uh, in basically two days a week after school. And on the weekends, I eventually got fed up with, but I performed and loved ski racing. But 
managing school and ski racing and having coaches and racing was uh, overwhelming. Just too much following the rules. And I was a kid, had to play. And there was no time to play so much unless it was after practice. But after practice, basically, it was I was drained of energy first off. And there was one hour left to do my thing and I had school on the next day and so on so it lasted for five years in the skiing competition team which was that's from six to good. 11. Mm, that's still a good time like mm-hmm. to to learn the, well not even the basics but the technique and I don't know about you but I also did a I think like you maybe five or six years of racing and that was basically the same thing but I I kept doing it because I loved just the training part of it where you have a course set up and you just slap kind of lapping the park but you lap the course and you do it again but yeah that was kind of the the part that made me want to stop was the coaching of like okay now you're going to work on that thing and you're going to give me your pulls and you're going to do that exercise and I would always be like no no I'm just gonna I just want to have fun and lap absolutely yeah which uh was fortunate enough because free skiing was being born well while I was being bored of all that coaching. And um, so it gave me something easy to transit to and came from a wealthy family, like not a super wealthy first class family, but just like parents that did not have worries about putting meals on the table. And um, so they afforded a pair of skis for me that Christmas and there were twin tips because I had bought the movie The Game, the Poor Boys production movie, saw that there was this major shift in skiing and my brother Vimoan and I were all drawn towards it. Those were all people living in VDP. So we, my parents uh, linked me up. So did you ever have a part where before that first twin tip pair where you'd go into parks with like racing skis definitely yeah uh could do the 360s and was definitely a war between snowboard and skiing at that point so was not accepted so well in the park although i'd come by and just like do my thing do an air in the in the little half pipe that was hand shaped and just fuck off basically because that's what snowboarders wanted Mm. they just really hated skiing at that point it wasn't seen so well and so did we we hated snowboarders because they hated us and it was just this uh stupid war going down yeah it was a weird time like i guess i was a bit too young to live it i was just witnessing it but from the perspective of someone a bit younger it was kind of a, a weird moment where i wasn't a part of it but i would just go in with my my racing skis and my racing suit and just be like okay i'm just gonna do my thing and do a 50 50 on a box and get on so what was that first pair of twin tips the salomon 1080 the classic the originals uh, yeah the yellow and black and once i got those my uh, birthday it was a birthday present my birthday's in the summer midsummer so it was like a torture to not be able to ski them for that long but I would set him on the ground and I'd just stand on him, stood on them and just mimic tricks that were in the, the game video and just like imagine myself doing that and thinking like I'm never going to be able to do the tricks they do in the game. <laughs> That's That was what the top was mm. back then. So th- that was like the influential movie for you? Uh, yeah, that's what like really sparked me to pursue start skiing and once i got hooked then a lot of other movies reveal themselves like uh royalty royalty was the second big one which was very style orientated and much more uh person persona orientated just like gave you much more of a glimpse of how these people's were how these people were and the soundtrack was just like really up my alley I was obviously and still am building myself as far as who am I. And I was figuring it out at that time. But that stuck with me like D'Angelo, Devil's Pie, 
Sister Nancy, Bam Bam, Sisla, Word of Truth, Words of Truth. Uh, Eric Pollard was Deltron 3030, 3030. Yeah, yeah. Like all songs that they're still on, they're still on my playlist. Well, we see the influence because you, you just named them one after the other. Like, you know it by heart. Mm-hmm. So you said that it seemed crazy what they were doing and it seemed like on another level. How was the, the thinking for you at that point of like the, the perspective of being a pro skier? Was it even like a, a dream? Was it something out of this world of you just loved skiing? And like, did you ever think that you would get to where you got at that point? No, I don't think it was a thought so much, a, fan, a fantasy. So I guess it was a thought, but it was a fantasy just to someday be able to do what they did. I guess when it really cemented itself that, and it, the timing was great, it's uh, around Exact Science, a Playhouse movie, which uh, must be 2005, 6, maybe I'm off on date, 2004. Might be a bit earlier than that. Yeah, four maybe, 2004. When Dish No Segment came out in that movie, with uh, the Liquid Sword song of Jizza and I witnessed it in the church where they premiered it in Quebec City. Super big premiere. Everybody was wilding out. Alcohol, people could drink. I wasn't drinking, obviously, too young. But when I saw that segment, I was like, okay, you can just, like, be cool on skis. Like, you can do... Obviously, his royalty segment showed just that, but the exact science part with hip-hop, like spoke to me even more because at that time I was much more hip hop influenced. Now I look back and the royalty segment is like probably my favorite at this point. But at that point, exact science, just like really, I got the DVD that night because you could buy it at the premiere and watched it back to back. You could rewind the part. And that was the only segment I would watch other noticeable mention in that movie like great people but really dish no just like the style was on another level the kits everything after seeing that movie exact science where were you at at that point in terms of a uh, of level were you already in doing competitions or did that come after yeah i might have been uh having my first sponsor then it's so hard to place myself within time hmm. my memory uh is drifting but I had my first sponsor at a Bromont contest where all the notorious Quebec skier at that point were like Charles Gagné, JFL, Frank Raymond, Johnny Ely back then, uh, Antoine Gagné. All, all the big dudes were and I went there. I was 12 years old and I did uh, just did the, the course basically, but I was so young and I hit the, the jump. But I was so young that I resonated with some uh, sponsors that were there. Like Rozzy told me, yo, we are looking for a young guy. Are you? Would you be willing to be on a program uh, like us, which was the orage for young kids? Same thing. Would you be willing to be on the program? And the dream came true. What sparked that uh, prior to that, I was like on a kind of a sketchy road because it was a secondary two. I was in a class with friends that were uh, everybody. I started to smoke weed like uh, at 12, early 12 years old, like yeah. way too young. So secondary two, which is like, I guess you're 13 or 14. It's like early high school. So I was 13 coming into secondary two and uh, I started to smoke weed that summer when I was 12, just turning 13, met some people at school that were in the same class that were uh, maybe not the best influences. And I hung out with them and they weren't skiers. So I would hang out and just smoke weed. And at some point in the, in the winter around like new year's that year, I went out and uh, with my cousin, We bought some weed at this at the ski resort, not even skiing. We we're just bumming, brought the weed back home, went and smoked it. And my uncle, which was my cousin's father, 
that was with me caught us smoking weed and it shocked me so hard like now I called my mother I told her I got caught but I wasn't smoking it was this other dude like I was just like trying to be like uh I, w- I wasn't being honest obviously I told her afterwards but at that point I was like damn I can't like deceive her that much she was shocked because obviously I, I don't have parents that are weed friendly at that point now with years I've definitely made them psychedelic and weed friendlier but at that point it was a no-go for sure and I got caught and I just said I I got two choices I keep hanging out with those dudes and keep smoking weed or I just stick to skiing and I stuck to skiing took that decision and three weeks later got the two sponsors and then it it clicked so I definitely probably took the good route definitely kind of a life telling you that you made the right choice Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah real blessing yeah and then when you said you'd focus on skiing was it like the only thing you were doing like were you doing other sports uh, at that point I played soccer but I didn't want to play soccer anymore because I love team sports but uh, at that point I was trying so hard and the energy within the soccer team at that age it's like anybody can go into a soccer team and Not everybody was giving it the same effort. And I was always giving my 111% just trying to be as good as possible and try to get it in and win. I like was drawn to win all the time. And a lot of people on the team weren't. And I found it hard to be with people that weren't as motivated. And that's where I branched off into an individual sport where I could be just like whatever I put in then that's what's in like I don't have to rely on this other person and rather like in this case I could feed off the other person's energy and choose who were my teammates rather than be like okay this is who you play with this is who you play with which now I've obviously grown to be fine and happy to do but at that time it was definitely harsh. After you got those two sponsors there's a big gap in my mind that I want you to fill. I didn't know you when when we were younger. The fill I knew is Phil Casabon, I don't know, maybe 17, 18, riding for Orage, Armada, already kind of pro, I guess, traveling the world, who releases B-Dog on Wild. What happens to 13-year-old Phil to get to that point? Kept it going, had support for my family, which, like I said, were wealthy enough to send me for a week in Whistler, tu- tutored by my sister, who was also like pursuing the free skiing dream. And we went to SMS camp and really like at SMS camp, got more acquainted with Alexi Gadbou and just made friends with him. And he was pursuing that too. So, and over there, I won the weekly contest of like the young, my category. So my parents... Obviously, you need some accomplishments to be to make it like noticeable to validate the process, kind of exact. And so that happened a summer in Wessler and then did the skiing thing again the next winter. And I by 14 years old, I got like my first check. I won my first contest, which gave me a bunch of loot, like three thousand dollars at a rail jam which was insane. I did my classic rail jam trick, two on, switch up, two out. That was the thing that got me the gold. And that was insane. Kept going, went to VT Open, got third at VT Open, and uh, did another event in uh, Quebec. I forget which it was, but that year I ended up stacking like a lot of money for a 14-year-old, maybe like 10 12 grand like staying at my parents and not paying food not paying rent not paying not paying it anything but like basically now I'm paying for my skis because I'm winning money so that's all I have to pay for basically at that point so I keep on doing the same thing start filming my first film is filmed by my brother he's filming uh us the crew and it's 
a no name film it's just a, a movie is that online no it's just uh it was just a a movie for us i don't think it we ever release it but it's probably on my brother's hard drive i'd be curious to see that mm -hmm. but the footage is online for my part and it's uh phil casabon or b dog 12 years old something mm. or 13 afterwards i met through the events the crew of new way production which was uh directed and filmer charles burroughs was the main dude there was uh jp caron jdesica david beaulieu justin maillard samuel robichaud all these homies and obviously influenced prior by advanced vision which were uh filmed by fred larue and lp sans façon and had like my favorite skiers from quebec jf Hull, charles gagné dom Legaré, like uh phil warren guillaume saint cyr all these guys were in the movie union that really made a impact on me but i got with the smaller crew the new way production which were like the second the like lesser known and lesser good guys if you will and got to film with uh, those dudes made two segments with new ray productions and then i filmed with mystic land that year when i was 17 stacked all my clips and uh nsf with jeff boutin took those clips and that's what i used at 17 years old in 2007 to make b dog gone wild it was a collage from these two three segments all over the place and just uh, made something with my favorite rap album. I was vibing to Red Men at that point. Red Gone Wild had just came out that same year. So I just said, ah, B. Dot Gone Wild, easy. I'll just name it the album or the title, cop the soundtrack uh, and just like call it, call it what it was. And that's uh, an edit that changed your whole career. I remember when you dropped that edit on New Schoolers, it was like, top rated for a month two months whatever and after that b dog was born the persona and as we were talking about before the podcast there was something kind of visionary in that sense where at that point in time the strategy was to film with a company to drop a segment and then that was it they sell the dvd or whatever and you had the vision that people would start doing maybe yes seven eight years later which is hey Give me all of that so I can make my own cut of it and really sit online. And that was a big, a big win. Yeah, absolutely. It was me being bored in the summer, basically not skiing and just having a brother that was familiar with the editing software uh, at that point, Adobe, still Adobe, but switched through Final Cut as well. One thing that I uh, jumped over that was that changed the game for me was J.P. Eau Claire, Yannick B., that Yannick B grew up at the same ski resort where I grew up. These, these structure would do these camps, like uh, reoccurring camps, and they came to VDP. Yannick took notice of me. JP took notice of me. JP put me on the team, and he even went as far as inviting me and putting me on his four-people team at Arage Master when I was 14 years old. That changed the game for me. I got to see Tanner, Candide. I saw them all which is the picture that you saw on the wall over there. That was JP inviting me to that event. And I was so grateful because out of anybody, like he could have went for the win. He didn't have a crystal ball at the time that was like, oh, Phil is going to be, become who he is going to become. It's a bet at that point when you're 14, 15. Fully. It's like give a chance to someone. And that is really inspiring to do. And JP put me on huge with that. Got me on Armada as the younger dude and that was all so quick it got me pretty stressed out and anxious like and I got my first injury that year in Mammoth just trying to outdo myself I tried to a rail jam like in the streets of Mammoth JF uh, was cash and money it was like money for tricks and it was a uh, down flat down rail a flat down box and a down flat down box. Frank Ramo was there. Tanner Rainville. JF. JF was like doing some unbelievable shit. So was Rainville. 
and I was up there pretty scared, like tired, just I've been skiing so much. And I did a two on that didn't go, caught my ski, broke my shoulder, almost a uh, full on open uh, wound, like the bone humerus was almost sticking out, got pins sticked in my shoulders. And that's like when I realized that the body was susceptible to real damage. And I really got shook from that first injury because I had no didn't put in perspective that the body could break down doing this stuff so that made me go on a rehab rehabilitation pattern uh, program figured out what it was to rehabilitate it sucked and I was like damn I don't want to rehabilitate again 16 years later Phil would tell you I rehabilitated about 16 more times and that's just what it was but at that point I did it and I also made it so I could come back as strongly as possible. I like gave it all. My mom at that point was like, drink a lot of milk because that's a lot of calcium and that's going to help your bones. I drank the whole, <laughs> she was over buying milk because I was drinking it all. Like now that I look back. Drinking the Kool-Aid. Yeah, <laughs> probably not a good thing, but I did it. And I think that the intention behind it probably made my bones stronger so I got back that summer I went to Whistler and uh, that's where I got clips for Assault the movie and you can see that Bill in Assault like uh, in the segment with Kim and Alexi with the song uh, Grits My Life Be Like Um, it's the last clip I'm crashing that's the crash but otherwise that really shocked me, but then that shock really reverberated and propelled me to create and outdo myself because I wasn't, at that point, I was finishing up with high school, basically coming to, and people were saying like, I'm going to be, I'm going to be an engineer, I'm going to be a doctor, and I get out of the stage and I said, I'm going to ski and that that was it like I told it to everybody the words the word was out and that's what I had to stick to and that really set the intention what was your mindset when you were saying that was it in terms of a dream or was it like this is what I'm going to do yeah fully this is what I'm gonna do that I'm gonna make living off from skiing that's sick Mm. tell me about I'm curious you mentioned JP helping you out. Um, I've talked to Belmar, who grew up in the same mountain as you, and he told me the exact same story of JP hooking him up and like being kind of, not a father figure, but you know, big brother helping him out. And um, basically, Alex was sponsored with, with Armada, but it started out as JP gave him giving him skis, you know, like it wasn't a through a rep or something it was jp giving alex skis so i never met jp but when you tell me those two stories he just seems like such a genuine nice guy it's crazy yeah again major love to jp for what he represented and what he did for skiing that goes way beyond skiing because he was much more than just uh, the skier and he was a loving person and that saw potential in Ben Mal and myself and just put us on pedestal alongside with many people. Like he was definitely a considerate human being that like took people and really treated them just how he wanted to be treated with love and care. And he wasn't too ego egocentric he just was he wasn't egocentric from my perspective I was like if I have to be someone I have to be like JP I have to have that type of character he was that mentor and I got real fortunate because he put me on Armada he was a door to putting me on Arage uh, and I got to travel a bunch with him because we were both Arage Armada Oakley and I got to be with the person that was had like a uh, wealth of knowledge 
and I was just next to him, seeing his moves, seeing how he acted, and it just really propelled me towards the direction I wanted to do because he was doing the movies as well. Like he was in the movies, but he was also making his movies, like UP UP one, UP one point two, like classic movies which weren't like serious and were playful movies and that really just like inspired me and now it's time for a first sponsor break tree fort lifestyles is a company based out of oregon they've been involved in the ski industry since their inception in 2011 when they made their first pair of suspenders for skiing they produce some of the nicest accessories you can find out there for your adventure activities whether you're going skiing hiking or traveling plus i've heard their famous suspenders are making a comeback this winter Go check them out at treefortlifestyles.com and use code MERA at checkout to get 15% off your order. Support companies that support skiing. Support Treefort Lifestyles. When you dropped that B-Dog Gone Wild edit, did you know it before dropping it that it was going to get the intention it got? I remember the moment vividly when I pressed upload on New Schoolers. I was with a friend that was in a skier and I felt like he didn't know, but I was like, all right, you ready? I'm I'm going to do it. I'm, and I didn't expect that much attention, but I knew I did something special, like, because I spent so much time making that edit, because at that point, that was the first piece I cut. I cut one thing before, but that was the first, like, thing I really dedicated some time to with the editing and once I pressed the upload, I knew that it had to make some wave because I never had seen anything along those lines of a like mixtape edit style. And I knew I had like something. Yeah, every ingredient was there looking back at it. Like every shot was banger, but there was a variety. There was park shots. There were urban shots. There were a bit of pow shots, I think, like some big, not big mountain, but some you know, some stuff outside of Quebec, let's say in Europe. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Just uh, was fortunate to travel. At that point, Orage and Armada, the program was that they would bring me on trips and they had the filmer and they didn't do anything with the footage other than give it to the athlete, really, or give it to Mystic Land. It, it was such a, a blessing to have Orage at that point because it was like, okay, we'll just bring you on this trip and we'll film you and wherever you want this footage to go, we'll give it. That doesn't happen anymore just like that. Yeah, and it's such a, a great concept because nowadays companies want content and stuff like that. And well, that strategy is basically the best to create content. Mm -hmm. go, on, go on travels with your team and film them and give, give them the liberty to do what they want afterwards. Absolutely, yeah. It's either that or uh, make a team movie, which is... Uh, very good or i mean there's many there's not just two routes there's endless amounts but i think making a team movie or giving the freedom to your athlete is two of the very good routes to take after that it had dropped which was in the summertime like it was in in a season right it was yeah it's summer kind of, yeah did you notice anything that changed well did anything change with your sponsor at that point Sponsor wise, no, I kept the kept the same sponsors, but I got hit up by Mike Hornbeck, and I was looking up to Mike Hornbeck. Saw what he did in uh, Turbo Turbo and uh, another ski flick, and the the biggest thing that happened from it was Frito Cody hit me up, and Frito told me like, "Yo, I really think you have a style of your own, and I think you should film with us." I had shot with him on one spot with JF on a small down rail, but nothing official. But this like really cemented like the fact that he, I was going to be in level one and that was the dream. So at that point you wanted to be a pro skier. What was a pro skier for you? Like what was your, your uh, aspirations? Because later on your in, in your career, there's two major options, which is doing films or doing competitions and then you had to choose between one of the two what was was it one of your goals did you want to do both did you want to do one or the other yeah it was both at that point um since it was uh possible and it still is for henrik 
let's say, to do both, but otherwise it's not really possible for many people to do well in contests and on the filming plateau. But at that point, it was you had to do both really to have a career because you had to be seen because there wasn't no media platform that are as large as this. Obviously, Facebook was starting to come along at that point, starting to get pretty big. So that was a, a big facet. But otherwise, like you'd see videos on new schoolers and that was pretty much it. That was the big platform. So it wasn't an option to be just like a film skier. But that's where my heart was, obviously. But I had to do contests and X Games was definitely a goal of mine to reach and to partake in, which happened uh in uh, 2009, just after the first year I shot with uh, Level 1. No, no, no. It was the same year I shot mm. with Level 1. Because got... both of those directions, you progressed in both aspects, like, um, in parallel? Yeah. You got to the big stage, let's say, X Games or the, the world stage competitions at the same time as you started filming with Level 1, like, it was really at the same time. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, it was uh, special energy at that point, and that was like uh, around 19, 19, 20 years old, youthful and just hungry, and still staying at my parents. No responsibility whatsoever that are very, that are serious, other than skiing, really. So it was easy to focus on just like just be good at skiing and ski all the time. And that's it. And my body was really healthy, still healthy. Also, it wasn't as specialized as it is today. It's not like you have these dudes that are slope style guys. Yeah, and, they present themselves as a slope style skier right, and, or a half pipe skier. Or like urban skiers. It yeah. was just like everybody did a bit of everything. So that lasts for a few year where a few years where I can do the do the X Games, film it with level one. So I do refresh and then I film a segment with I, on uh, iTrip. And obviously through all that, I've met with Henrik when I was 17 at LOX and we connected, bonded together and got to see each other again uh, next fall at Les Diableraies, fully random. I got brought from an event at um, Les Arcs, a French mountain that was hosting a rail jam. Met Mick Deschno. He was like, yo, I'm going to Les Diableraies to ski. That's where I ski at this time of year around September, October. I, f I jump on. I'm like, I just met Mikel and he's bringing me somewhere. Meet Henrik. We end up being in the same room. He's listening to Cameron, Joel, Santana, all that stuff. I'm loving it. I show him my repertoire, hip hop. We both vibe on hip hop. We start filming each other, vibing hard. And then uh, that's exactly when I wanted to make a web series, but I didn't see it as a web series. I just wanted to produce something with another person because I love Meth and Red and the energy and Blackout, the movie, and just the Meth and Red show. I love how they both associated. Ultimately, my bigger goal was to have a, a Wu-Tang skiing, killer bees, like on the swarm, nine people. But that was difficult to do, to have nine people in a group at the same time and do the thing because it was all scattered all over the place. But Henrik and I, it worked great. Henrik was like uh, amongst my first pick. It was either Henrik or Paul Bergeron, but uh, life took its normal route and put me with Henrik, which was a real blessing because we kicked it off and we started the B&E at that point, like not officially, but... So you talk a lot about Wu-Tang and I hope they pay you royalties because... You probably made like, uh, I don't know how many thousand kids start listening to Wu-Tang. How did that come about, that love for that group? Uh, from my brother. He, my older brother, would listen to hip-hop. 
And on the computer on iTunes, there was like songs from You God, songs from Method Man, songs from Jizza, songs from Rizza, songs from Master Killer, and then the Wu Tang, all the other uh, members I haven't named as well, and DMX as well, which was a big one outside of the Wu, but which was a huge uh, influence of hip hop. But I would listen to all these dudes like. And I didn't connect the dots for a while that all these dudes were part of the Wu-Tang. I was like, Wu-Tang, that's a guy. I'm like 10 years old. So that started there where I loved Bruce Lee movies, like Enter the Dragon. I watched that again and again, like back in the day, like that was my shit, really. Like the Kung Fu flicks I loved. And when I heard the samples on the Wu-Tang music, I was finding myself again even more and I love the vibe of the hip-hop so when Mikhail's segment Li- Jizza Liquid Swords Wu-Tang and Skin like Jizza and Skin eh, I was just like sold and they just have a repertoire of music and also a bond that ultimately you don't see anywhere else like you can't name a group of Nine dudes that do the same thing. They all are MCs. RZA's making the beat, sure, but they all do the same thing. It's like a group of nine nine guitarists. You're not going to see that. You're going to see a drummer, uh, a guitar dude, and uh, a singer, but and uh, a saxophonist and whatnot. But nine guys that did and that could stay together and make albums and tour. That was really special. And I always admired that and was drawn towards trying to create that sort of system with friends that we could all move as one Mm -hmm. unit and just make skiing look cool and also move whatever it was, merchandise. Yeah. Well, there's something cool of teamwork. It seems more fun on my side as a filmer to film with a big group instead of just being one skier because you have the, the whole friend vibe going on and you're not alone in your struggle so there's that fun side of like doing ski movies in a group and everything but there's also the the fact of reaching more people as a group like let's say with the B&E with you and Enric there was something of appealing to more people there there's something in French we say uh, l'union fait la force Mm -hmm. you know like I don't know it doesn't translate well but you know teaming up makes something greater you know yeah that Aishen slogan it's a slogan for the IT, the country. What I just said? Yeah, oh. Fait la force. Oh. that's on their flag. Oh yeah, I didn't yeah. know that. And now it's time for a second sponsor break. Access Board Shop is a ski and snowboard shop based out of saint Sauveur, Quebec, Canada. They've been in business since 2002 and have supported skiing since day one. From sponsoring numerous athletes to putting on competitions to helping out movie productions, they've done it all. Axis is the core board shop and they've got everything that you might need this season. Check them out at accessboutique.com or go check out their shop in Saint Sauveur. Support companies that support skiing. Support Access Board Shop. So, before the BNE, you filmed with Level One for two years. Yeah, two full segments. Yeah, exactly. Um, Looking back on your career that has spanned what now what, more than fifteen years, let's mm-hmm. say two years is not a lot, but it seems that you're kind of associated with level one. Like you really made a stamp of these two years were two years that marked the skiing world. Mm-hmm. It was pivotal moments in skiing. And also the crew in level one was all time. It was a really golden era, like with Wallace coming out, Delorme, Hornbeck, Henrik, Ahmed, Ahmed Wiley Miller, Liam, Rainville. There was so many people all together uniting to and brogan like so many styles various styles from various places and it was a pivotal era and i was fortunate to be at a a strong moment in my career at that point to make a lasting impact and have all my time dedicated to it the second year when i filmed with them i got hurt for a month quickly like rehabbed and got back on and that's when i filmed the i trip segment did the little skit with my brother in montreal with the intro red man smash something the puppet being born into life igor 
when I came to the premiere, they didn't want to show me the segment, but like we uh, have been discussing, I'm so hands-on everything for that refresh segment. I went to Denver and I was in the studio with them. I chose the song. I knew what shots would come after, you know, I was, I was there. And for the iTrip segment, I, they didn't let me see. They were like, wait till the premiere. You're going to be stoked. And I'm so meticulous with my shit at the premiere when it dropped and they, they, uh, took off the curse words, which is like, if you want that, that's it's like, and it, all the chorus of the Smash Something song was gone away. And I was like, no, 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 they didn't do that on me. They took away all the swear words. And that's like the chorus. The chorus is hype and it's all swear. Yeah, and that, that's the thing that for hip hop songs, it would, like, I remember with Eminem songs, it would do that a lot when they would play the video clip and Eminem would swear every two words. So then you... It wasn't even listenable when you would hear it censoring songs like that. It just exactly. butchers it. Mm. Exactly. So that came as a bad surprise. And plus I was uh, with Henrik in that segment and they didn't put one of his uh, great shots, a switched up nine. And uh, I was like, wait a minute. This is not like what I signed up for. And obviously now looking back, I I was way, way too harsh on them and... I, I would have loved to keep filming with Level 1 because their quality of content, I don't think I had anything as quality, although with Brady, it's it's been a blessing. But those dudes really put in the the work, pre-production, in-production, and post-production. Those guys are real professional and love working with them as well. But that threw me off. And at that point, Eric Iberg and Tanner approached Henrik and I at the festival in uh annecy which was an if3 back then they had an annecy in france and they told us then we were holding on to muddy winter like one of our edit that would make basically the best bne edit in my mind that we've ever done in regarding like uh, relative to time that's where we put the most effort in and iberg and tanner approaches us and we're like we're starting inspired media. What about you put a logo on your next edit? And I was like, okay, we're going all in. We're going B and E. At that point, it had been a year since you started the B and E. So you had a full year of hype and like getting things together. And as you said, muddy winter was probably going to be one of the biggest episodes you put out. You're skiing at hood and then in New Zealand, right? Exactly. And like one of the most banger park edits ever. Mm hmm. So we had that and I knew that we didn't need level one to make cool content. So at that point I was like, okay, we're take, I'm going to move forward. Obviously with Henrik uh, approval, we're going to move forward with just going as B and E and just make a season under inspired only B and E. Hmm. Was there any concerns at that point in the business side of things? For your sponsors of yeah, saying, hey, I'm going to do I it mean, on my own. Right. But Orage was given, suppose, like 5,000 to level one for me to be in their movie. Hmm. And I would still pay for trips to go with level one and pay for food. So I was like, just shoot me that 5,000. I'm going to pay for a filmer and we're going to make something. But were they open to that? Were they receptive yeah. of the potential? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mike Nick, uh, at that point, maybe... Yeah, Mike Nick had, had just jumped in as the team manager at that point, and he was all in to supporting that kind of movement. That's sick, because I don't know if you ever experienced that in skiing, but I think it's that in any really business sphere, that it was a good time to do what you did. But you never know if the person in charge is going to be aware of that. Then you could have had someone who said, no, 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 uh, stick with producing movies. Uh, we like selling DVDs. And you would be like, man, like we're, we're on the next stage now. Yeah, could have easily been like that. And in most cases, it would have been. But fortunately, the team manager was a ex-professional skier. And so he was all into letting things slide and just like, yeah, sure, do you. That's dope. Mm. Looking back at those two segments of level one. 
which one's your favorite segment refresh definitely yeah because i trip i got hurt and missed a month and a half in the winter but refresh just came so easily and i did all the contests that season i think that was the season in life where things were synchronic synchronized the best for me like just like oh i'm here in utah oh phil you're here for this do tour then just come on with us on this uh pow trip cool it just like everything was put in order easily and things were much more easy uh to manage at that point because i didn't have to take care of every single aspect now as a free skier literally if you want to be making money and having a name for yourself you got to be a uh, free skier director you got to produce you got to you got to be a marketing you got yeah, you got to social do, media influencer you got to do so many wear so many hats to to run this thing and that's what it is and like i hire i hire my filmers i pay them i it's it's no more like phil come on this trip yeah and i'm on the trip and i'm skiing and i'm getting clips and i get the clips and i make edits now it's like now i got to decide where we go and what spots we do and who's and filming and i'm taking care of the winch if the winch breaks i'm taking care of it it's like yeah you're the producer yeah it's it it came with the age that's just what how it is but i also the state of the industry has changed yeah that was something you um you kind of started by starting the B&E with Enric that maybe you didn't have in mind because at the beginning it was only park edits but then you brought it to another level which required maybe some of the production value that level one brought and then it was like okay well that's what's behind the scenes right like we need exactly. to do all of those stuff mm-hmm. but yeah your refresh segment is a classic like there's like you said everything fell into place and it's something that doesn't happen anymore so it has a special place in history where you have i don't know if it's half and half but you have a good quantity of backcountry booters and urban shots and i always love those segments because it's i don't know it's it's well rounded it gives you a bit of everything Mm -hmm. there's something special about those kind of segments yeah so do i and definitely like looking back i'm i i would want to see phil be staying with level one and filming other years with level one and being uh on that train but i'm uh more than happy with the decision i took of taking things onto my own hands and mm. also the experience it gives is yeah it must have taught you so no much price there's no price to this experience it's you have to jump in to swim and really like otherwise if you always are tutored and always have something someone telling you where and what moves to make then you're not really fully growing into what you fully can be you have to commit and really want to learn and just like face the fact that it's not as easy but once you get the grip on it then get the ball rolling then it carries momentum and Mm. rolls by himself because then you got a big momentum that you're still carrying today because when I grew up, I really saw Tanner All as the competition guy, but really as a film fan, as a someone who was doing something special with movies of producing his own projects. Like in the 2000s, he did so many. Uh, he did, was he producing Dubsky 106? Uh, yeah, co-producing probably with Iberg. Yeah, and then and CP. Uh, Believe and The Massive. And he, he did a lot of, he did Retalac later on, but he did a lot of his own projects. And I feel like you and Enric are that equivalent for the 2010s. Like producing quality stuff year after year. It takes a lot of dedication to, to do that much stuff and make it happen. Absolutely, yeah. And that comes with... Uh, and Henrik is a big reason why I had that much drive i always been passionate but really being affiliated with the most passionate and the best like free skier basically like there's none other that can quite match up with henrik in my mind and so i was associated with him which gave me like 
my hardships because being associated with someone who is regarded as the best of the best, sometimes you get overlooked and placed second. And sometimes it's like you don't get considered as much as the other person, which creates its own challenges that are very uh, difficult to overcome at first when you've never been faced by that, when you're used to being like, yo, this dude is dope, like, it, you see Phil, now it's like a, a sidekick role at some point, and I was like, I ain't taking this, but that fueled kind of like me wanting to, to, when I branched out, and do bring me to, to like the X Games, like real ski and that type of stuff, really was fueled by being like a bit put aside by the fact that I was with someone that was better skier than me, but as far as like creating and producing and the idea revolving around the B&E, I felt like I was running the show and I was putting more time into like the concept, the concepts of the episodes and all that. So I was leaving aside my skiing skills. So I was like constantly in between two like in between like I am I producing or skiing and couldn't find really my comfortable ground at that point even though like these episodes still stand out and are my favorite like can't wait is probably my next to muddy winter my one of my favorite B &E episodes but all the thought revolving around producing and the concept of it was a bit draining towards my skiing uh, fulfillment. Hmm. So you had a feeling at what point of being like a sidekick in the B&E? Uh, definitely as far as like uh, being treated or maybe not in the B&E for those years. That that was uh, mostly more after when it came to like uh, the education of style and really Henrik like his uh his yeah, becoming the next big skier yeah yeah his skill level and also like his uh yeah his skill level and dedication was way beyond mine and then like when my segment was shown after his or my segment was shown before his then i'd definitely be like damn this dude is killing me right now and that definitely like forced me to and that was my well, view of it as an outsider i can tell you i never had that feeling for me, like I, I only thought about it now because you said it. At the time, it was like the two guys, not that you were on the same level because you weren't. It wasn't even comparable. You were just two different types of guy. But there was not a discussion in terms of talent mm. or whatever word you want to put in. It was, if you want my, my two cents in that movie, in The Education of Style, it looked more of that for Tanner because you guys were both on top of your games and... I think he was maybe in a weird phase with injuries at that point. But in my mind, he stood out in that movie of being like the oddball. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's also like a, a perspective and a like a, a, a demon, a sort of like judgment you hold. And always your biggest critique is yourself. So it's like, yeah. and also like I had a lot of years comparison myself to Henrik which mm -hmm. was the absolute cream of the crop so I was like damn like until like that really was a uh, valuable valuable lessons because it brought me to the point where I didn't compare myself anymore to anybody and really chose to fulfill myself and be cool with what I produce rather than be or have to be at the level that someone that I am not, so I cannot mm -hmm. do the same thing. It's a lot about perspective, because you're good friends with him and you ski with him a lot, whereas for most people, we only see the edit and we see the final product of the two guys together. And what you were doing was not in the education of style. You had two, you had your own parts in the movie, but in your B&E edits, it was a lot of back and forth between you guys. So there wasn't like, oh, there's the... The Phil part and the Enric part. It was like both of you. Absolutely. Yeah. And I don't know where I was going with that. Yeah. I was talking with um, with Belmar and he was telling me a thing that I, is similar to that is he felt he was getting behind on the slope style scene 
from, I don't know, maybe 2015. And he kept on and he went to the Olympics in 2018. And I was telling him, well, man, on my side, you weren't falling behind. You were still in the top level and you won the Olympic qualifier in 2016. But on his, in his mind, he was like, yeah, I like he was kind of in a bad state mentally of thinking he was out. And I find there's a, there's a big thing in that in the, the mental game, like mm. where your head's at. Absolutely. In terms of confidence or yeah, your, your self-image. Mm-hmm. How you, uh, the interpretation you apply will be different than your next. And obviously, like, I'm so, I am starting to be less, but I was so self-centered that all I saw was like how I should be getting attention at that point. And that's like a very egotistical uh, moment also, which is like narcissistic and something that I've learned fortunately to tame having to face the fact that I'm not necessarily the best like and feels good to not have to be the best and just have to be yourself and that's a big realization that comes from and not everybody has to even ch have that challenge but that was mine uh, uh with Henrik let's say in in uh but in retrospect that's not like what I obviously we all I what I see most is the progression and the propelment that it gave me because he was such a driving force motivational that it gave me that push to be like yeah he's going extra I might as well do what Henrik's doing because he's yeah. succeeding so much pushing and you to be your best self exactly one thing I'm curious to talk to you about is in the progression of skiing, there was a big push towards double corks and triple corks. And there was a big discussion for a while. Uh, it seems like it's died down a bit since now everybody's doing them. But at some point there was, people were also almost assuming that you were taking a stance of like, because there was no question that you were talented enough to do them, but you weren't. So people were like, oh, okay, Phil is against them or he doesn't want to do them. Um, what, what was your train? What was your thoughts around that? Because you were skiing. It, mostly, I'm saying that because we're talking about Enric, and he's someone who never shied away from that. Really, you know, like he he did the, the nose butter triple cork and stuff like that. How was it with him, like going on that train, let's say, and doing those tricks versus you? I was just not ready to jump in and do them really because I didn't practice enough jumping. I like I never spent like two months in Colorado on big jumps. I was like always two weeks in Colorado. The weather was bad. I had like two days to hit the big jumps and I never could practice enough. And I never either like really was into water ramps because I thought they hurt. And I never was into much of the outside of skiing, doing tricks. So they were really scary to me. So was it a thing of being comfortable on jumps? Yeah, it yeah. was a thing of not being comfortable enough to send a double. Like mm. at that point, I wasn't like ready. I don't think. That's the thing also Belma was saying on my side, I saw him progress from being a guy from Quebec who would do switch stands, let's say. And then he was learning right side doubles. So on my side, I always thought he was, you know, comfortable and everything. But he was telling me also like on his side, it was later on. He got, he was comfortable enough to do those. But then when it came to triples, he was like, mm, uh, y you know, there's that little something of it, it's getting a bit too crazy for me. Right. Yeah. And you are best to respect that if you want to move forward for the best interest of yourself, because if there's something that's not clicking right, obviously you're going to get scared in skiing. You're going to have to face your fears and realize that it wasn't that bad but sometimes your instincts might tell you best and you might avoid a pretty big injury if you're smart enough to listen to your inner self that's saying like maybe not now and uh, at that point yeah I wasn't taking any stance against like uh, doubles or anything I was just like no nah, I can't do them so wasn't your thing yeah I, I'm not about to land on my head to to win yeah because landing a rail depends on the size of the rail but landing on a rail is less uh there's less risks right or 
there's big risk on rail as well it's just as far as like the platform where you practice like now they have like the maximize where they jump into a bag like if i would have came up then and i jumped into that bag i would have sent that double and landed on my face and mm -hmm. be like oh i'm gonna do it again and now i'm gonna land it but at that point all i had i was skiing mostly and that that was on me because i didn't move out to the bigger resorts yeah, out that west. was the thing you needed for us Quebecers, it was, well, you need to go and break for a month and ski real jumps. Fully, yeah. And then just huck it and hope for the best. Yeah, exactly. And that wasn't uh, that wasn't my field. I because I, I don't know. I was spending too much. It was like early January or early December. All December, I'm filming urban. Early January, I'm filming urban. There's maybe a do tour throughout that that I'm skiing jumps and just like haven't jumped in doing six what months. you know yeah doing what i learned and maybe learning something new and then there's x games and then like okay i'm not gonna learn a trick here at this like i don't know i didn't feel comfortable to learn that trick on jumps that i was learning speed every day and just getting comfortable with so i just lacked practice as far as like air awareness yeah from what you're telling me it's it seems like the time constraint where it's like you're competing and then when you're not competing well you have better things to do than hike a jump and learn that wasn't your priority exactly just a priority factor and then that leads us into something we skipped kind of a bit uh because you competed for a while right in x games and do tour and all of that what memory do you keep of that five years maybe that you were like really competing in x games and everything it was good i love the i love the competition scene during the times that i did it and uh actually like have some regrets of not like doing certain moves and certain tricks at certain moments and having doubts but that's what you learn from right it's just like mistakes and then feel bad about your mistakes learn from it And so I'm fortunate that I didn't make those mistakes and that I didn't like win everything and just am in the same place that I was like 10 years ago. That was a good time. Partaking to X Games was a dream. And I got fifth on my first invitation and then kept doing the thing. That second year I did X Games, thought I was going to get the third, got fourth, was questionable. And then the coaches and the olympic ring started to appear and now at the top i was no longer by myself listening to red man i was next to a coach and i had to listen like so it would take me through your run phil mm. and that year when that happened i went to shit like literally that turned you off i i didn't qualify at do tour i crashed bad at x games i fully like lost the mojo like My cloth was not the same and it set me in a different direction. I had to take a different stance, a different approach because I was not fit for that anymore. Like I realized that something was just not right. Hmm. I'm curious when you talk about mistakes and stuff that you wanted to do that you didn't do. Do you have some examples of some runs or some tricks that you had in mind that you wanted to do? Yeah, suppose the first year of X Games, I had a solid, solid run. And I think I I could win. And my father was like, my father was even reinforcing that. Like he was like, I think you got it and you could be on the podium. You just have to jump on the transfer. And on my third run, I is had that, a, Is that, sorry, is that the year TJ won? Yeah. With the transfer? Yeah, yeah exactly. Okay. And I had to do the transfer and I was scared as hell to do my right side spin on that transfer. And right before the transfer, uh, jump uh, on the cannon box, I do the cork nine blunt on the cannon box. And I was thinking about the transfer and I just didn't do the jump. I just said, fuck it. I, I was too kind scared. Of played it safe. I mean, not even. I just like stopped my run. I Yeah, I like landed a cork nine and just braked and went on the side of the jump 
because I was focusing too hard on the transfer and I had even forgotten about that jump, you know, and I was so scared about doing that transfer jump. But really, I'm sure it would have been kind of froze you. Yeah, it fully froze me. I got shook and I didn't do it. And that was like uh, something that I I beat myself up a bit about because I was like, damn, I could have really. And it wasn't like a year that I was far off. Like I got fifth with a run that wasn't my best run. And like the podium was really accessible. And at that point, I thought a podium at X Games will change my life, which it really doesn't you know in the in a long scheme but yeah in the in a long career like you did but in the short term it might yeah, do a bit for sure um but what was your plan on the on the gap it was to do my uh right side seven going from view. from the right jump to the left landing yep mm. yep exactly and what'd you do in the run you landed just right just right seven without the transfer okay yeah right seven or right nine Uh, right seven at that point. Mm. Yeah. Into cork nine, maybe? Cork. I wonder what I did on the last jump. Might have been right nine to switch ten, something like yeah, that. Yeah, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah, that, that that's nice to hear those inputs into the runs because a lot of times X Games was a weird thing to watch of not having inside. It was just, you know, one run after the others. And um, there was, they would not show a run. Like, you, let's say you would have your run. Meanwhile, they were playing a, uh, advertisement so as a viewer it was really weird to really get the full gist of what was going on you know fully yeah and that's what happened to me that first year like my run i got fifth with never got aired and is nowhere because it got a commercial that's over. that's such a weird thing yeah it was like kind of a shattering because at that point like i'm this young dude and i'm at x games and oh i can't see my run My run's nowhere. No one, see, no one saw my run. That's weird. It's like you, you wouldn't see that in, you know, football. Like, oh, uh, we didn't see the third quarter. Why? Well, we played some, uh, some ads. Right. It's like you, you wouldn't never think that. But uh, that goes with their priority. Like, oh, Quebec Canadian, sure, put the put the commercial during this this guy. I want to ask you about that, because as someone from Quebec, I've always felt like there was something a bit like. I don't know what there was, but it seems like a... Because I've also seen that happen with Belmar, where he was in X Games and, whoop, here's an ad. Or it seems like there was something about us where not considered as much as other people or, you know, like kind of those odd kids in the corner where, oh, you know, they're not Euro Europeans. They're from America, but they're not Americans. And, you know, mm -hmm. did you ever have... Because you had a, a chance that not a lot of Quebecers have where the whole world embraced you. Like people from everywhere love you and you manage to make a name for yourself. But there's a lot of people where I feel like there's a limitation because they're not necessarily fluent in English and uh, Quebec's a small market and they have a hard time of like getting attention out of Quebec. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And that goes with uh, personality and putting yourself out there very much. So it's like with Alki, who is much more uh, introvert, I'm pretty introvert as well, but I'm, I'm a, I'm a little more extrovert and put myself out with content and showed a bit more, uh, personality. And like, uh, for my man, Frank Bourgeois, like he barely got, I don't think he's got even 10,000 followers on Instagram and dude's got three gold medals and yeah. a silver at X games dominated the real, real snow thing. And, but he's, not necessarily trying to put himself out there. He's not like, you see, you see Henrik at the bottom of his runs and he's like, Brrr, woo, tanks for the children. And it's like, yeah, people want that kind of show. And it depends on your persona. Like, are you going to be that dude? You don't have to be. And it's cool if you're not. But if you are, then the X Games are definitely going to put you on that pedestal because... They're putting on a show. Yeah, exactly. Like Charles Gagné was winning because he was the best, but he definitely never got really like praised or known because he was so humble and just low key that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, people would say that he was, but I think that's really in a in a hardcore skier kind of realm. Mm -hmm. Like he, he didn't 
have that mainstream appeal, let's say, as uh, Simon Dumont had, or exactly. Then also, you could say it, it's there's multiple factors going into that, but yeah, I get what you're saying. So once the Olympic got around, you said a coach was a big no-no for you, and like having someone tell you it. That old thing started in 2011. First Olympics was in 2014 with slope style for you. When you got on the national team for a while. Yep. Two how, years. How long did it take you to say, oh, yeah. A year and a half. I reaped the benefits off of them. They were, I mean, the advantages of being on the Canadian team, probably Alki told you, but it was, there was nothing like it. They would bring you, and it was like with the Arage days, but it was a Canadian team. All I had to do was like, and but they had physiotherapists. They had all these professionals taking care of you. Free tickets all over Canada, uh, trip to Mammoth, a free trip to New Zealand. Like, you're mm. kidding me? I'm jumping on. But So you're at a point where were you kind of uh, weighing the positive and negative and saying, oh, I don't like competing, but these are some great conditions? Or in 2011, were you thinking, okay, I'm going to try to get to the Olympics? Or did you already know you weren't down? No, I wasn't going. I was just, and basically like, those trips were all before the contest season so the trip to new zealand suppose i just got on the team we take a trip to new zealand shit's fucking epic coaches are filming me i'm doing my thing taking a trip to mammoth shit's epic then i go to do tour and that's when like i'm on top and the coach is next to me and at that point i wasn't uh strong enough to tell the coach like i give me my space I just need space. Because then again, the co you knew the coach, right? Uh, yeah, Tobin. I mean, Cusso I knew, but Tobin not so much a okay. bit, but definitely was acquainted to him with these two trips. And then X Games, I had a bad crash, just like slipped totally. Hadn't practiced, hadn't jumped, just got into it like with zero practice. And afterwards... I was filming for the Education of Style, took a trip to Whistler. The Canadian team was there. They were like, Phil, we're doing this airbag session. Are you coming? It was a powder day. I was like, no, I'm not going. And uh, another another uh, of those events went by. Phil, another airbag session. Are you coming? No, nah, there's powder out there. So I canceled. And then they called me and were like, Phil, we're not going to be able to keep going with this team and that's something that I really subconsciously wanted because I didn't fit with the team but I wasn't like going to tell them oh this is not what I want to do yeah so it was like uh are you in or are you out kind of talk yeah my, in my memory it was more like uh, we can't keep going with you Phil mm. like just like you're out okay and I was uh more than happy at that point I was stuck in uh in between mount in between mammoth and mount hood we our van broke and a special piece in the van broke and we had to make it ship over there and we were three days in this place we call alcatraz but it was alteraz and uh we were just stuck there uh henrik eiberg and i trying to figure out what we do uh, i mean we were doing nothing we had to wait for the van and then i got the call I was like, cool, I'm just focused on this education of style for the rest of the year, then perfect, because I had missed out on some valuable days because I had gotten hurt that year. Was it freeing for you? Yeah, yeah, definitely. It felt really good to take or to have that decision taken for me, but that was something that I was really hmm. feeling. Because you always seemed like someone who knew what he wanted and not really thinking back like looking forward and okay like when you you stopped filming with level one you knew you wanted to do your own projects and you didn't like maybe now we're talking about it we're reflecting on it but was there a part of you where you you thought about oh am i missing something with the olympics even though it wasn't a dream for a lot of people you know it, for us it was x games was there a part of you kind of thinking about it saying oh is am i making a good move should i try and get there or no, it was pretty clear at that point that it was not meant to be for mm -hmm. me at all. And all this, like, 
prior experience at contests like had just showed me that it was not for me. So then after that, you released The Education of Style. A big thing that was different from other movies is the fact that you had long segments. In other movies, it would be more of like, let's say, level one movies, multiple segments of two minutes, two minutes and a half, whereas you were yourself, Tanner Hall, and Enric, so only three segments, but that lasted, what, eight minutes each? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Which was like um, I an Iberg idea, and uh, I vouched for it. I thought it was a good idea, but I didn't think that a lot of the footage that I had showed up for an eight-minute segment. Some of the stuff was like not A+, plus, and I was like, ah, oh, I always like regretted a bit to, that that segment was that long. I would have shortened it ideally in an idealistic world. I would have made that segment shorter, although there was also time for that story to be told, which was basically that segment was um, a story told about my year. It starts off with the Bobby Digital soundtrack and it says it in the song itself like, with a, uh, a being struggling with the good and bad within himself. And so that year, I felt like a lot of inner struggle with the Canadian Association and myself trying to really take a stand on who I was and what I was trying to pursue and mixed in between these two opposites. And that segment with like mushrooms, I think, which was the tea, the potion that I was given was like a psychedelic so I can go inside myself and search for the answer. And it really like what we try to showcase is the roller coaster ride that a psychedelic can give a unsteady mind, a mind that is a bit feeble and just like very easily uh, shaken. And that's what my mind felt that year. So we went in that route to showcase that and The last sec, the last uh, song of the segment is "Pit of Snakes," and the chorus to that is "We come awake and chop the heads of these snakes." It's better, uh, come awake and chop the heads of these snakes. What's the name of the song? It's the Pit of Snakes, the Grave Diggers. Come awake and chop the. It's better. It's better off than dying in a pit full of snakes. snakes. No. The snake inside Become itself. awake and chop the heads of these snakes. It's better off than and dying in a pit full of snakes. snakes. Mistake inside yourself, that'd be the first, first head you take. take. It's better off than dying in a pit full of snakes. Right. So basically, that chorus meant to me that the pit of snakes basically was my metaphor, my analogy to the whole system that was being structured in skiing, like the whole fist foundation and that was like my rebellious note to that was that song that it was better it was better to chop that head of myself like chop that dream of wanting to be part of that foundation and maybe partake in like that great event that was going to happen just to really please the grandfather and the father figure in my mind rather than really what I was wanting to do because at that point 22 23 years old and still today like there's often thoughts that are not necessarily mine and that come from condition and maybe even ancestors way beyond my grandfather and my father like great 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 grandfather that did some bullshit or that acted in some way and That's a karmic energy that I see that can still withhold. And I think the cleanse within that segment, like the idea was to clean myself from at least that uncertainty of like being drawn towards that uh, dream of going to the Olympics that wasn't mine at all. And just like really chopping that down and making sure that I stuck with my guts and stuck with what I really believed in and that was just a sh uh, my scream to that whole uh, system mm. with that song it's interesting to hear you talk about the whole thought that you put into it because it's something that you do with your projects that there's a level of 
depth of not only thought but like energy put into into something that not a lot of people do i think it's nice to see because i never had your explanation and i never saw it that way but looking at it it makes sense but it's nice to you know there's a lot of uh, movies out there not only not ski movies but like real fiction movies where that's a thing where you can watch it and just enjoy it for what you see but there's also a second layer that if someone tells you or if you you, you look hard enough you'll notice and then that's nice to have those two kind of things like if someone just goes in it it's a it's a nice part but also with that explanation it i'll be interested to look back at it with that mindset hell yeah uh i've never told it to anybody before because i've never spoke about it or have been asked like was there a founding concept behind like the whole like psychedelic movement in your segment and why did you choose like to Obviously, a lot of it was influenced by Tom Penny uh, segment in Sorry, which was a flip movie, a skateboard movie. And but Penny really it was just like uh, a few little like uh, psychedelic effects in his segment because his new pro model board was uh, mushroom. And so like they they sort of ran with it and Penny influenced me a whole lot. But I wanted to ingrain and we all wanted to ingrain in our segments a story about our season and for instance like Henrik was the story to the little patty which was drawn from belly the movie that Nas featured in and is also the intro of one of the tracks from Illmatic Nas's album or more so not an intro but it's in the one of the song I think it's in it ain't hard to tell on the Illmatic album He talks about this scene where he meets, meets a little kid on a bench that like is barely 13 and he's puffing a blunt and just got caught in like a shooting. And that was the idea behind Hendrix. So we all had like our little concepts that we were trying to build off of. And mine was the psychedelic realm and the struggle of just having to take a decision and being unsure. But that year I had access to like a G editor like that's why that segment like there is psychedelic effects but they're not really half ass like they're really well made if like not necessarily like top level but up there like expert skill level like effects and I was like yeah that's a good time to do so because I'm not going to be able to do these effects like anytime soon mm. by myself I'd be curious to see Looking back at with you telling me the concept, I would have been curious to see your version with more of the visual duality between competition and your segment. You mm. know, that's me as a, I guess, filmmaker kind of right. imagining stuff. But yeah, I would think there would have been a cool, like maybe alternate concept of you competing and that old state of mind, and then the 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 shrooms like lighting you up to the filming side. Of like your true self or maybe that's a bit cheesy how i said it but no no but that's what that's what uh we tried to showcase but in a very nuanced uh and very uh art like um yeah second degree kind of like yeah not not uh not a like this is what it is mm -hmm. just like uh something that is uh nuance and something that you might not get and that's yeah. why like nobody really got it because i did it uh especially for myself so i can look back like 50, 40 years from now and be like that's what i had in mind that was like the moment where i sort of like took the decision to switch off from com competing to strictly focus on one thing and i struggled inwardly to do so And do doing so, presenting it on some uh, pedestal that is very, uh, I, and doing so in a very abstract way. Yeah. Well, that segment is unique, as a way to put it. Mm -hmm. There's definitely your your classic skiing that is top notch, but yeah, it stands out as conceptually something like that you never did afterward. No. Right. Yeah. It's, yeah. Because. It definitely wasn't received so well because 
a lot of the shit was butchered. Like, a lot of the clips were like, whoa, it was like, there was no other way than to fully commit to the concept. Mm. I couldn't have, like, did, oh, I'm just going to trip, like, for a moment of the segment, and at this part, yeah. we can make it less. It was just like, nah, this is going to be all in, like, experience. Mm. And But I thought it it fit the style you had done with the B&E episodes. Mm. The, the editing style, kind of, of, like, chopping thing is uh, some shots halfway or you know just like unconventional editing mm -hmm. so for, for me it like it was kind of a a fit for your your kind of skiing brand that, that's crazy thinking about it because you stop competing but you still got to make sponsors happy and the year after that you do the inspired demo tour which was a tour where you went to multiple resorts or like something over 30 Yeah, 50 resorts in 66 days. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. And you went around the most unattractive resorts ever. Like you didn't go to Whistler and Aspen and stuff like that. You went to small hills in the Midwest and in New England. How was that received in terms of saying, hey, I'm not going to the Olympics, but I will go to that small hill in Connecticut I guess uh, everybody took it fairly well because they had faith in what I was doing, fortunately. And the idea behind the old demo tour was to make sure that we hit the most underground resorts that they're never going to think about seeing any pro because all the pros are going where the good skiing is. So that was the whole idea, which was conceptualized by Eric Eiberg who set up the map for us. And that turned out to be one of the most memorable and highly lovable moments of my career, like traveling these places and just like skiing and skiing and skiing, mm. regardless of the condition. Yeah. Kids were stoked. Sometimes there were two, three, four kids with us. That was it. Like it was a week that you had to not go to school to come with us. But these kids would take school off and Because that's crazy. It makes me think of JP and what you told. You said he, he did for you. And you probably made a lot of kids stay, like seeing their idol in their small hill and getting to ride with them. Like that's a lot of karma points, like making people happy. Yeah, I thought so. And it was, uh, it was both ways. Like I was getting just as much as I was given It was so fulfilling and the crew was top notch, like such great people. I uh, definitely will do another demo tour before uh, I stop or I'll never stop skiing, but I stop doing the professional skiing lifestyle. And plus there's something really, I guess, noble of the point of being a pro skier is saying, oh, I used to ride the small mountain in Quebec. I'll, now I'll get to go to the Alps or, you know, whatever, seeing the best. And then you're using that leverage to put attention on smaller things, which is sick. Yeah, I mean, for sure. Just, just a brain, uh, the brain of Eric Eiberg that really set us on a great path. And we were fortunate to have Eiberg around for these years because he really directed us in righteous ways and that was such a great idea we gathered uh we gathered all the clips from the demo tour i went to sweden filmed with henrik we um did ra a bunch and uh with all that footage that we had we went to mount hood then i broke my jaw that was over spent time in quebec Then we edited the movie, each on our side, which was going to be Let It Flow. Made the soundtrack happen with uh, Riga, a good friend of us that makes beats. And we made the movie Let It Flow. And through the demo tour, we had to release every day uh, a, 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 a post on our website saying what had happened, what was going down, what was next, etc., And plus we had B and E episodes of every states we'd go at. So we were working all the time during that time, but we were saving footage for the Let It Flow movie. And so all our best clips from these little resorts were put into that. Plus 
a few urban trips. Tanner came to Quebec for a week and filmed urban with me over here. Really special. And uh, Sweden put together the movie, sold it on iTunes. I don't. I th- I think we sold like definitely under a thousand copies. And obviously, we don't make money from that. iTunes takes a percentage, and ne- not expecting to see any money, but definitely a weird route to take. But it was sort of like uh, a test, a crash test route. Like, is this is this where the ski movie scene mm. is going? Is yeah. this like a lot of people? had taken that route but at that time like a lot of content was coming out for free so it was hard to say and that's around the time when you released your movie too Mm -hmm. which you said uh was not online for free at first right yeah what platform uh did you put it on i wanted to put it only on digital download because i had noticed at that time that dvds were dead okay but i I was someone who grew up on dvd so i was kind of skewed i i was late at the party for that but the people I was doing the movie with were still really attached to DVDs. So I still made them. But yeah, so there were DVDs and online like digital downloads. Mm. I don't know. It seemed the, the whole iTunes thing seemed like a struggle for the quantity or, you know, the, the attention we were getting. So it was like through a smaller website. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it seemed looking back at it, uh, I think I should have put it online, but then again, it's hard to say like when you're in the moment of like, what's the best strategy and we're wearing so many different hats that we're not necessarily like a strategist of like content or I don't know how you would define that at that time, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that didn't necessarily like jump off the way we envisioned it, but it was all cool because we had a great time doing the movie and the movie was dope. And that set us off finally for refreshment because Henrik and I had been like shooting together and been together for quite a while at that point. However, like our friendship was really good, but still when you hang out with the same person at some point, you're going to find aspects about him that you don't like, which reflects to be aspects of you in the end that you don't like, but you find it through another person and that's the whole duality thing. But it felt good that next year to come into a year that we were not going to be together and we were going to make solo projects. That's the year where you made Keynote Skier. Yep. And that year was one of the best years I've ever had because of that refreshment of like not having any duty, not having to be on a demo tour, which I love to be on, but it's like, it's still, you have to be places and do stuff. Now I could just be on the program of filming 100 percent dedicated to one thing fully and it came once again like that refresh year everything fell into place real neat i got with marco marco gilbert first he came in shall we we shot spots and we were getting like two or three clips a day that were like pretty banger and that rarely happens anymore but like that's what was happening at that point and then i'd go to montreal with marco at that point i had a girlfriend that was living in montreal so i was exploring a whole different a uh, whole new uh montreal scene of urban and it's so full it's endless over there it's just the only mm. big issue is security mostly but yeah really got away with some ill spots over there and just like easy just like you drove a, places yeah you hit a lot of spots in montreal that here mm-hmm. cool spots but first that all started with a mammoth mammoth trip mammoth trips would get me on like mammoth laps are so fast that they get your skiing feet really really ready and i got to link with mike hornbeck in minnesota after which is the second segment of the movie called mount everest this is all based off the keynote speaker you got album and those are my favorite tracks basically and the trip to minnesota with hornbeck was so refreshing because i had never done a trip where someone would take me to spots like nothing the the person we were filming with brandon husak knew every single spot in minnesota and he would take us there we would just be where's that Oh, that's at the high school high. 
just like 15 minutes away. We're going there tomorrow. Hmm. And we got in that mentality that we're just going to make the most out of every spot. We're not going to be like, I'm not sure I'm feeling that spot. We're showing up at the spot. We're getting a shot. That's what the mentality was. And yeah. Looking back at it, it's an insanely productive year because uh, you've done so many stuff that I, I kind of forget about that year. But you have shots from Europe where you have some sick urban and kind of pow shots. You have shots from Minnesota, from Montreal. You got going that year. Yeah, Estonia, Finland. That year was crazy. Oh, yeah. That's also the year you had your Armada oil and water segment. Yep. Okay. Well, that's a year where you have a lot of classic shots. Yeah, you were so talking, much. You were talking about Minnesota. Yeah. Let's talk about that four kink. Right. That was, uh, that's definitely one of my highlights of my career. Yeah. You have, so for people who might not remember or haven't seen it, there's a four kink rail and you do a lip on tail press and then a lip on and nose press on, on kind of different parts of the rail but on a level which has never been seen before mm -hmm. like that shot with the nose press is never been done it's something that even the people who don't know anything about skiing see it and are like how did he do that yeah funny thing about that is like once i got that trick i wasn't even stoked uh, it was a it was special because i was like not really satisfied it That year, I was being really hard on myself and just like, I wanted to make something big. I feel like maybe I felt like that whole, the education of style, like I told you earlier, being like, seeing Henrik skiing being so much ahead of mine just fueled me. And also even in Let It Flow, just like being second to Henrik, I was like, damn, I really got to get mines. And that's also the last segment of this movie is a, a You God tune called Get Mines. And that's really how I felt. I was like, I really got to just go in and show what I can do because I have potential and I, I just have to get that recognition once again, which was like fueled by an ego and just like that was hungry. But It made it made for uh, great ski footage. Yeah, there's also that kind of a uh, cannon rail, let's say, in Minnesota. That level level one also hit. Right. Or I think Will Berman does a rodeo out. Yep. You went to that and hit it in another way to land in the stairs. Right. What made you want to do that? Because it seems like a natural way to hit it is looking at it is oh we'll do the cannon rail, but then you hit it completely different. A uh, speed. We couldn't hit the cannon rail because that's... Uh, kind of requires a winch. Definitely, unless you have like a good team to pull the bungee. But we were Hornbeck and I to pull the bungee. So we had to rely on like what our speed would allow us to do. And that seemed like the most progressive way to hit it in our minds at that point. And it worked out really well. Like I wasn't expecting. So what was your favorite trip on that year? This Minnesota trip, yep, that really like was an eye opener for me and just set the bar. And really, the spots over there was so fresh, and everywhere I'd go, it was like so easy to get a clip. Um, and there's also that shot where it looks like it's at a school, maybe, where you slide a rail, you and you hop on to another one by only pressing your nose and like lifting up your tail tips four feet in the air mm -hmm. and i don't no offense to the filmer or the editor but i don't think it does justice to how hard that is like i look at that as someone who skied all my life and i'm like dude that's so gnarly or so i don't know how i do that like there's nose presses but that's like the ultimate nose press of you lifted your tails like to your head to get on that rail Right. Yeah. It took a bunch of uh, eating the rail inside the hip and the, yeah, I just like ran into that rail on my ribs and hips constantly until finally I made it up there and got to slide on it. But it took a, took a little bit, but it happened eventually quick. And that was all like, all this segment is seven day trip. That's like seven days. That's one hell of a productive trip. Yeah, that 
that trip really just like set the bar and Hornbeck and I speak about that trip a bunch and I don't think we're ever going to have something like it quite but maybe we will yeah because maybe a, a good ratio is like one shot per day if you're productive because the time of going to a spot building the spot maybe having a battle and then you got to get some rest but you had way more than a shot a day in that like there's I don't know how many shots, but there's a lot. Yeah, we were getting clipped up. And then also in Montreal, you went back to a lot of classic places like the Olympic Stadium, but found new ways to hit it. Right, yeah. How was that process for you? It's just being in a new place where I've never been and just seeing spots automatically inspired, like, and with a team that was ready to do it and the best homies too, like V Monk and Frank GP, as far as uh, skiers and Marco, Vince and Jean Spag was around, Fala, just like a, a really tight and solid crew that bonded everything and made everything so easy. This spot is at the Olympic Stadium and we got there at the same time as Step Production. They were going to do a spot on the other side and we were there on the same same hour early in the morning and they caught the attention of the security guard so the security guard showed up kicked them out and then kicked us out but i was still doing the trick and the police showed up and we all got a ticket and uh so stepped stepped, stepped is the reason you got your shot uh yeah they, they they allowed you to have time to get it yeah exactly and also the reason why we got the ticket oh <laughs> so it's positive and negative so that whole movie is a classic really of yours thanks man like i i realized that i haven't watched it in a while but just looking a bit looking at it with you right now there's so much stuff going on putting on a 18 minute movie of one person basically like there's some cameos in there but it's basically solely you is a big accomplishment of getting because you didn't fill it with b footage like it's all bangers and all serious stuff and then looking back on it it's on new schoolers and there's a small number of 285,000 views yeah that year we had a special way to present footage like road to zion got 400,000 views keynote skier got 280,000 iberg had found a way to make the view count like go crazy because everything would add up and he would put it on uh, all these platforms ski press ski journal daily motion and everything all the numbers would add up and i don't know i never definitely my biggest view count for as long as i mean it's 16 minutes it's not like it's a three minute edit but yeah i don't know how that happened but it never reoccurred Now I'm having trouble to get like 20 or 30,000 views. Like it's really difficult now to get people to watch it. Yeah, well, like we were talking about earlier, I think there's something with the, the way content is shared right now with Instagram. Whereas at some point with Facebook, you would post your embedded YouTube video or Vimeo video and people would share it. And the more it was shared, the more it was seen with the algorithm. And all the views would accumulate because it wasn't a Facebook video. It was an embedded YouTube video. Mm. Whereas right now, sharing on people share a lot on Instagram. But it doesn't accumulate to anything concrete in terms of numbers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure, uh, uh, you have 100 followers that shared it. But there's nothing at the end of the day that like you can pinpoint to a sponsor, let's say. or So it it's kind of hard to quantify things right now. So much. So after Keynote Skier, you went on to a two-year project yep. with Enric. Yep. So you, Back yeah, so you took a year to do solo projects and what made you want to make the move? Because I never thought of it that way, but it's really like that. You did the B&E with Enric and Education of Style for a couple of years, then took one year off, but right after you came back and did a two-year project with him. Yeah, our, at that point, Like, our relationship wasn't the greatest. Like, it wasn't either bad or anything, but we weren't, like, necessarily, like, uh, we were definitely pulling on some on strings. Like, 
We were easily getting on each other nerves, but Iberg was definitely the bond between us that was like, yo, I'm making one more ski movies and I'm out the game. That's it after this. And Henrik and I obviously were like jumping on the opportunity. He was like, I'm gonna make the illest soundtrack skin as ever seen, which he stepped up to and accomplished. And uh, so we jumped into that whole program and quite quickly Henrik blew his shoulder that year uh, broke his collarbone and we it sort of was up in the air I think we were going for a one-year project and we said okay take it to two years Henrik broke his collarbone again right after he just had broke it and what was the injury the reason behind the two year uh yeah yeah one of them and also uh just noticing that the soundtrack wasn't going to happen in one year. So Henrik gets hurt, gets hurt again. And at that point, I'm not really focusing on filming for Be Inspired anymore because I don't have my uh, the partner who's filming with it for, but I end up like in Quebec at the end of the season getting a few clips uh, for the movie which end up being in the Samurai Showdown part. Afterwards, I take a trip to Riggs Granson, which is really more of a like experience with my friend I've grown up with in uh, my home resort, V-Monk. We go there with some Swedish friends and we camp out for a month and a half, shoot quite a bit, but not necessarily intended to be in Be Inspired because Henrik's not in it. And I was thinking like, I'm just going to, wait till I'm with Henrik so we can get shots for the movie actually so it makes more sense summer goes by I make an edit of the season and I'm like should I release what I haven't filmed with Henrik and decide not to release it good idea because that next year early on I blow my knee so now it's my turn like in January my knee's blown and I can't film anymore for Be Inspired. So I only had like that first year and two months in the winter. So the goal was to have a movie film, the both of you together, like a team effort. Yeah. And it ended up being kind of a weird combination of him being hurt and then you being hurt. Exactly. We got like, which are my favorite segments of the movie, but the Mammoth segment, we were together. And the street knowledge segment, we were together in Shikutsumi and Shawi. And those segments really showcase, I think, that energy that we had together. But I love that movie as, as a whole. But really, the goal was to have us together and build off each other and just like build off each other's energy to uplift the level. But mm. regardless, it came out as a very good movie is just obviously it didn't go according to the scenario we hoped yeah well you still managed to put something out that was great thank and you then it's the yeah it's always what you had in mind versus what happened exactly yeah and people didn't know what we had in mind so in the end it's yeah from what we saw good. yeah um tell me about the whole soundtrack deal uh, Iberg was in contact with this DJ from Jamaica, Walshy Fire, who is part of a bigger group uh, that's called Major Laser that has a big renown following. And uh, Iberg was in contact with him through his inspired music concept. He traveled to Jamaica and made some connections there. He talked and... Iberg is just a man as far as making things happen and calling people and convincing people to get together. And like he made countless amounts of project that you could put on to each on top of each other. And you'd be like, oh, my, he did all that. So the idea was to have a hip hop artist and a reggae artist on each track and not any hip hop and reggae artists like Cormega and Sizzla, Raekwon and Kabaka Pyramid. CJ Fly and Kirk and uh, CJ Fly and Randy Valentine, like all 
heavy hitters mm. nonstop, like Massacre and Cardinal Official, just like banger after banger. A big way of doing things, I feel like, for ski movies for a while, we're not having the rights to a song. You take a cool rap song, you don't have the rights, you release it. Whereas you win the, the really legit way. Fully. And the idea behind exclusive built soundtrack is Iberg's idea, basically. And he instilled it into us is you have to make sure that that person never had sex to that song or never partied to that song or never saw the sun setting or never finished high school to that song, but just like is experiencing this movie and this visual footage for the first time to that song. So that song, when they listen to it, brings them back directly to that footage. Not only did you have the right for the songs, but they were made for the movie. Exactly, yeah. They were specific, be inspired songs. Yep. Yep, built a, a soundtrack, be inspired soundtrack. That's crazy. Insane. Has that ever been done before? Uh, Iberg only did it with uh, Idea. Mm. Idea had an exclusive soundtrack, but he didn't have the range that he had with Be Inspired. Be Inspired was just insane to have Cormega and Sizzla. Yeah, how do you manage to convince those people to take the time? I don't know how long it takes to build a, a song. Yeah, I mean... It, a lot of it was pay. Yeah, you had to pay them. One thing was like with Raekwon, Raekwon was 10,000 a verse. But that verse of Raekwon and Be Inspired was 10 Gs. And at that point, Henrik and I was like starting to deal with CL95, which was an upcoming company that took Ralph Lauren 95 polo classic cream outfit that Raekwon was wearing and was going to remake that. And they were like, we'd like to have you guys be the snow team for that. And we we're like, cool, cool. Ended up like he frauded us and he never paid us the contract, but he did pay up the 10 grand for Raekwon to do his verse. Raekwon got his verse done. And then it was easy to get a reggae artist on a track that had Raekwon vocals because every reggae artist were like Raekwon fans. So mm. then we had that. It's only a matter of having someone influential and then other people want to join in. Exactly. Then it's like, and yeah, the Iberg just made connections and is very, uh, very adamant about speaking to people constantly and just maintaining relationships and making sure that these relationships are taken care of. So that that goes far when you uh, he's he, he was 36 at the time. When you've been doing it for 36 years, it's like you're going to have good relationships. That's a crazy feat in itself. Just that. Not only the fact that you put out a two-year project with Insane Skiing, but making that happen in the ski world is... Special. Yeah. Is that one of your proudest achievements? But in a sense, it's not really a skiing achievement, but it's something of reaching out outside of the ski industry, you know? It's really special. Like... uh just like a, a ego boost brag, but mm. I got my name on a Raekwon song. Raekwon shouting me out as like uh, my N-word Phil. Like he shouted me out like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's a pretty funny thing. That's to, a bucket list thing. Yeah, it's insane. After Be Inspired, you produce another movie, Tempo. Then you go back again to a solo project. Yep. Yeah, at that point, uh, Henrik was on the road to the Peoching Olympics, like yeah. fully doing the qualification and focusing were, on that. You were on a different schedule. Fully. And uh, I just came back from a blown knee. From that blown knee, I couldn't ski. And that was my first blown knee. I didn't know how it was going to go. So I took it real slowly and steadily and... Just built off footage and really just like started stacking in late January and slowly started to build something that made sense and went into late June in Rick's grandson, stayed there and just had a bunch of footage to make a movie with, which 
I came in the summer and I was so happy because I had so much material to work with, although it wasn't my favorite stuff because I took it slightly lightly because I was coming back from a knee injury. So uh, there's a confidence that you have to build back and such and such. But that year I used the Iberg approach and I went and saw my friends every week to build the soundtrack like every Wednesday we'd meet and we built songs I'd build off what they did constantly build in found a slight concept to the whole movie and um, boom called the tempo and it worked out I was really happy on at that point that was my highest achievement as far as editing wise like how to it was a highly conceptual like i remember there was a part of kind of video game vibe right right of going from one level to another which matched with color teams exactly yeah so i kept it red and green and just kept those same outfits so that year i just like rode only with red or with green then that was it and was that a con conscious effort yeah from the start yeah mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a fun project to make, re regardless of uh, coming back from an injury. It gave me, it gave me faith and focus in something. Let's talk about your knee. That's the first blown knee you had. How did that happen? That happened over the course of two times. I hurt myself in January filming for Be Inspired on a Switch 9 in Utah. Just landed weird. One ski in a bomb hole, one ski outside the bomb hole, and it was not soft snow. Failed the tweak, came back, took a month and a half break, saw specialists. They were like, yeah, I think in a month and a half you'll be all healed. It's a slight tear. I'm like, cool. Start skiing again. Go to my local resort. Do a back two off a rail. And it just popped out. It popped. And uh, luckily I was just here. I was here like in VDP. And it popped. It could have happened like in the backcountry in Utah, which would suck much more. But <clears throat> I was right here and my father was there. Everybody was there. So it was easy at that level, but definitely crushing. Just like realizing it's always a realization that that's it. That's it for this year. Like I can't film anymore. Mm. Damn, I had so much plans like I wanted. And once again, tempo was sort of like built off that like energy of I, I wasn't done yet and then tempo at the end like I learned like a dub cork 12 which I didn't intend to do and uh, switched up tens and I learned a bunch of jump tricks because like in be inspired I really wanted to have like my best jump shit and it wouldn't happen because I blew my knee and I couldn't make it to the hmm. trips so that fueled me for tempo and basically like it built it built the momentum and just like it it sort of like fueled the flame that's great that you use that in a productive way let's say mm -hmm. and i'm curious when you say i didn't intend to do the dub 12 what do you mean like he, not on the takeoff i guess more of like he, it wasn't plan you didn't plan on learning the dub 12 right uh yeah yeah that day i was planning on doing it but i never wanted to do that trick it was not like oh, i really want to do a dub 12 or something but i was like it's time for me to like flip around twice going forward and doing it like hmm. and that was like part of the 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 fuel from not being able to fulfill my be inspired full potential and i guess that was as we said earlier as someone who was in the the uh, biggest fan of jumps or didn't have the the resources necessarily to to get better when you were younger you did it in rick's Cranson, which is in sweden in the springtime when it must have been slushy was that like the the kind ideal. of day where you were like okay it's now or never ideal scenario for sure yeah poppy jump sled toe don't get tired slushy landing just ideal that's that's where i want to learn tricks and how did it go 
when you i crashed so much oh yeah if you see the footage of me trying that trick i ate so much shit because when we see the shot it looks like i would i wouldn't have been surprised if you said oh yeah first try i got it no no it didn't work out well for sure for a little bit i had to figure out how to really set a double cork like i did the switch doubles but that's a different thing than the forward one to me yeah there's a lot of weird rotations with forward double course where some people do it more to the back others do it more to the side kind of mm -hmm. like the the first cork set yeah there's yeah you're right whereas a switch dub there's kind of a classic way of doing it right yeah next up on your insane list of accomplishment is the real ski contest i think we should do a, a separate episodes just on that because i think there's a lot of stuff to be talked about Yeah, I think uh, we could go through a lot as well on a different one. Great. Let's stop there and we'll do another episode on that. Until next time, Xavier. <laughs> Peace. Peace. Farewell. Thanks, man. Ciao. So this is it. Episode five out of the way. I hope you enjoyed it. I really enjoyed talking with Phil. And I guess when we'll have some time, we'll do a third episode to talk about real ski and the two years he won. So big shout out to Axis Board Shop and Tree Fort Lifestyle for supporting the podcast and we'll see you next time. Bye.